But on we go. On we go. This wheel, it never stops. Manganese. Great. Manganese 2. Manganese is what? Is that group 7? I'm looking over at my periodic table. I'm counting across 7. A group number of 7. And subtracting an oxidation state of 2 will give us 5 electrons. 5 electrons. It's got 6 ligands. It'll be in an octahedral geometry. And we know the octahedral splitting is 2 above 3. Where should we put the electrons? We go 1, we go 2, we go 3. Where do we go next? Where do we go next? Next we go up here. The reason for this is these water ligands. These water ligands don't interact very strongly with the metal d orbitals. What that means in practice is that perturbation, the difference between it interacting in a favourable and an unfavourable way, the clash, if you like, between the ligand and the d orbitals, that's quite small. This gap is small, these orbitals are very close in energy, and that means you avoid the repulsion of putting two electrons in the same orbital by promoting them up a little bit in energy to these two higher orbitals up here. So we have got a lot of unpaired electrons, a lot of unpaired electrons. N here, N is equal to 5. Oh, punctuating maths. Is there anything this man can't do? So many things. N is equal to 5. N plus 2 then is equal to 7. We're going to take the square root of 35. Let's do it. Square root of 35. 5.91. I'm looking at the, the third decimal point. I'm rounding up to 5.92. 5.92 Bohr magnetons. That's a lot of Bohr magnetons. And the answer. It's both of those things. My computer has shut down. <laughs> what was the next question? Okay, cobalt. Oh, yes. Great element. So it's a cobalt 2 complex. Ooh. Cobalt's in group 9, one of my favourite groups. And an oxidation state of 2 will give us a D electron count of 7. There are four ligands. Four ligands. Here they're in a tetrahedral geometry with the tetrahedral splitting of 3 above 2. The opposite way, if you like, to the octahedral splitting. How are we going to fill them up? 1, 2. That's not even worth thinking about. It's just the only places those electrons can go. And then you'll remember that the tetrahedral splitting, uh, delta T, is small. It's about four ninths of the analogous octahedral splitting. It's a bit scrappy, isn't it? Let's put the bar on the T. So this promotion is going to be easy. We're going to put them up here instead of putting them in the same orbital as another electron. But when we get to five, we don't have any choice. We've got to pair up somewhere. So you may as well pair up in the low energy electrons, that's 6 and this is 7. There are then three unpaired electrons. We've got 1, we've got 2, we've got 3. N is equal to 3. So this expression, square root of 3 into 5, will give us the effective magnetic moment. We asked the calculator what the square root of 15 is. Calculator says 3.87. Bohr magnetons. I would say everyone's favourite unit. But I haven't really asked anyone else ever what their favourite unit is. That's a win. Have some marks.
Copper. Copper two. Ooh. Ooh. Copper two. Copper two. Copper two. Copper is in group 11, just before zinc. It's in the plus two oxidation state. We should have nine D electrons. With six ligands, we'll adopt an octahedral geometry. And that three above two splitting that we so know and love, where are we going to put them? One, two. Again, with this water ligand, this weak field ligand, we will have a small gap between these energy levels, a small ligand field splitting delta. And this means that promotion is favorable to pairing. So we get to five. For the sixth one, there's no choice. Seven, there, eight, and nine. So if you like, there's one gap here. One gap. So a couple of things. I guess the magnetic moment's easy. So there is only one unpaired electron. So for the spin-only formula, you get the square root of 1 times 3. That's a, that's a time symbol. Don't even worry about it. We ask the calculator, what is root 3? 1.73? 1.73 bore magnetons. That's nice. Something to note, though, something your further reading should have highlighted to you. Copper 2 complexes often exhibit a yarn teller distortion. Copper 2 complexes often exhibit a yarn teller distortion. So I hope in your further reading you are looking up the yarn teller distortion. And you're able to identify this asymmetric filling of these higher energy electrons as fertile ground for a yarn teller distortion. Something you should be finding out on your own, by yourself, and then seeking help and clarification if you need it. Hit the books.